son remained calm as the judge read the sentence, death by execution. Josue Flores was murdered last Tuesday on his way home from school. The men confessed to shooting the teen execution style. There was some uh, satanic type activity taking place. Officers tell us Trujillo stabbed her boyfriend with stiletto heel shoes. Two-year-old Riley Ann Sawyer's brutal killing shocked the nation. She was beaten to death, stuffed in a plastic box found by a fisherman in Galveston Bay. Former NFL player Antonio Armstrong Sr. and his wife, Dawn Armstrong, were murdered. We, the jury, find the defendant, Antonio Armstrong Jr., guilty. One by one, they describe the deaths of the alleged other eight victims of the convicted rail car killer. Welcome to season four of The Evidence Room. Our original docu-series takes you deep into the evidence archives to explore some of the most notorious crimes our area has ever seen. And we begin this season with a case against Ana Trujillo, who came to be known as the Stiletto Heel Killer. Sunday, June 9, 2013. What is your emergency, ma'am? He started talking, he just told his friend, like, he hit him with my shoe and my like, he's bleeding. Is he breathing at all? No, I don't know. Not at all. Okay, ma'am, we're dispatching emergency units to 1701 Herman, apartment 1801. Is that correct? Homicide. He died? Yeah, Stefan is, Stefan is dead, yes. I was giving him out to my it's the crime that made worldwide headlines, all for one reason, the murder weapon. Anna Trujillo hit her boyfriend with its point 25 times. But it's what happened before that's up for debate. He attacked me and I defended myself. The day of the murder, Trujillo says she and victim Stefan Anderson had been drinking before they both went home to his luxury condo. I walked in and all of a sudden, he just turned around and completely changed and he was accusing me that I was going to leave. Then she says he attacked her. The pain was so excruciating and I was in fear and all I had was my shoe, so I just took my shoe off and I didn't know what else to do and I just started to hit him. Why, if this was self-defense, you struck him some 25 times. I wasn't counting or I wasn't intending to hit him. I didn't even know that I, that I was hitting him or you know that he was hurt because of his rage and he was still so strong. I cannot understand he had been drinking like three days, binge drinking. When you're a lifetime prosecutor and someone who's done homicides for a while, there are cases that hit your desk and you know immediately this is a special one. My name's John Jordan, I'm an assistant district attorney and I was one of the prosecutors on the Anna Trujillo murder case. How quickly did the case cross your desk? Literally, I received the case the next day. We learned some new details about the events leading up to the murder and the relationship between the suspect and the victim. But here is that video of Anna Trujillo, 44-year-old who is now charged with murdering her boyfriend. According to court documents, the two went to a club Saturday night and shared two bottles of wine and tequila shots. Then they went back to the victim's home and early Sunday, they got into an altercation about Trujillo leaving town to visit her daughter. Now, Trujillo told police that during a brief struggle, she stabbed her boyfriend several times with her stiletto heel. And so I was fighting and fighting, right? And, and I was begging him to let me go, but I did grab by the hair and I was trying to get out, you know? And then he, he wouldn't, he got more on top of me. And I, I put a roof over my face, you Is know. Is he sitting on you or laying on you? Or? Yeah, he's on top. Yeah, like, yeah, he got me. 
you know, wrestled because I was trying to get away. So he, he landed on top of me. Okay. And so I, I grabbed, I remember grabbing him by the hair and, or his shirt or whatever I could, right, to try to get from underneath him because I was suffocating. She was moving out and he didn't want her to move out. He was drunk and uh, he's a pretty bad alcoholic from when I came to find out. And something snapped and they got into a fight. Jack Carroll, I was the uh, lead defense attorney for Anna Trujillo. I wasn't breathing in it. And the more I couldn't breathe, like I was losing consciousness. And, but then, yeah, he did hit me. He started, like with one hand, he got me and then he started hitting me and I was telling him to please stop. And so I was like, and he was hitting me, I couldn't breathe. So the only thing I could do was get this arm and I, I don't know if I took my shoe off or I was there. And I was pleased that, and I wasn't in there, so I got the shoe and I started, like, please, like, whatever I could. I was trying to grab whatever I could. And I was just, yeah, I was hitting him to please get away, right? And then he lost his balance while I was hitting him, you know? And then, so then I got on top of him, you know? And I was like, stay down, Stefan. But then he grabbed me. He wouldn't let me go. You believed her? Yeah, I did. The evidence was all there. And and then he, like, when he would grab me, he was trying to hit me, and I was like, please. I'm like, and I was, I was just, and then he grabbed me, and I, I was just hitting him with a shoe, please stop, stop. And then that's when I, I got, I was trying to get, and he wouldn't let me, you know, like, he had me, and I was like, please. And I was like, Stefan. And then that's when I saw the blood, and I was like, oh, Stefan, please listen, you're bleeding. If I let you go, can you, are you, can you, can you not hurt me? Were you able to see where the blood was coming from on him? No, I, at first I didn't even see anything. I didn't even know there was blood coming out of him. It, it, he was, he was so like full of, you know, like angry and rage. Yeah, yeah. He didn't even seem like he was hurt or nothing was wrong with him. He was so, like, you know, and he was still, like, he, you know, it's like he was growing, like, doing, and, you know, and I was like, and here I am, like, and I felt sick and, like, I saw him when he started, he was bleeding, and I was like, <gasps> when I saw the blood, I was like, <gasps> like, like, if I would have known, you know, it's like, I, panic and I just saw the blood but I didn't care like little blood you know it's the blood started coming out so I I just grabbed and I kept giving him like breathing and he, he was he was breathing so that's when I called I was at that crime scene within 20 48 hours where I was given access to the apartment and I saw the blood and the blood pattern that crime scene gave us an indication of what went on in that apartment. That didn't mean that there couldn't have been abuse prior to that, but as far as the crime scene and where the blood was, pretty quickly we realized that what she was claiming um, just didn't, um, wasn't consistent with what the crime was. How key was the blood spatter to the investigation? Well, the blood spatter ended up being key not only to the investigation, but in the trial itself because witnesses can tell you different things. The great thing about scientific evidence, it doesn't lie. Um, it told a story and that story through Chris Duncan, one of the foremost experts at the time, was that Dr. Stefan Anderson was laying on his back as she continued to strike him 25 or 30 times with that high heel shoe. Um, the way that the cast off was, the way that the blood hit the wall, um, the way that her, her jeans were soaked in blood, it was obvious that she had straddled him and she had beaten him to death. Was there any blood high up? No. Only the cast off that would have come up from when you hit a source and then it would come up. So in other words, if her version was accurate, you would have seen more blood at a higher level on the wall. In addition, there would be the, the furniture would be disturbed because she talked about a struggle um, and things of that nature. How do you reconcile the fact that his testimony was based on the blood splatter? It showed that he was on the floor 
being hit repeatedly and not someone who is standing and getting hit by somebody who's trying to defend themselves and get away. We hired, uh, I guess, a very famous blood spatter expert by the name of Tom Bevel. If you ever watch the forensic files, he's on there all the time on some of the bigger cases that they've ever had. And uh, I hired him and he told me uh, he felt she was guilty, that the blood uh, spatter didn't add up. When I looked at it, it was like a picture that's been painted. And to me, I felt I could see what actually happened. That didn't give you a moment of pause at all? No. At what point did you go, this is not a case of self-defense. This is murder, and we're going to try it as murder. You know, obviously in the state of Texas, you get the, you know, you can claim self-defense in, in Texas because of our culture. Um, people will sometimes give someone that self-defense. So not only do you have to look at the physical evidence, you have to look at the surrounding circumstances. Pretty early on, we were able to track down the cab driver who had taken Stefan and the defendant from the last bar they were at in the medical center to the high-rise apartment. And I spoke to her within a couple of weeks of the murder. And she explains how Stefan was very calm during that cab ride home. She was yelling at him, screaming at him, cursing him, belittling him all the way to the apartment. For what? She wanted to stay at the, at the bar, allegedly. You can see the footage. She is walking around. She is flirting with a bunch of people. He wants to go home. The footage from the lobby of the apartment complex, he walks in and he appears to be defeated. His, his head is down and you see him going into the elevator. Moments later, she would kill him. I wanted to leave and he didn't let me leave. He wouldn't let me leave. And I'm like, please. You know, please let me leave. Keep in mind, it is a fiction that they were still together. They had broken up. Anna Trujillo was couch surfing through different people. She was staying at Stefan's home briefly because she was planning on going to West Texas. You know this because her luggage was still in the doorway of the apartment. So the, the relationship had already ended. Her defense attorney argued that he was a drunk who just snapped and became enraged. Stefan Anderson was an alcoholic, um, no denying that. He drank a lot, but not one person that we talked to who witnessed him intoxicated ever saw him angry, as opposed to Anna Trujillo. I immediately thought when I thought a woman with stilettos kills a guy, I immediately thought of Anna. Jim Carroll says it's been about five months since he last saw Anna Trujillo. He knows her, though, as Anna Fox and says she's a masseuse. The two, he says, were just friends, but they hung out quite a bit. Sitting on my balcony twice, she told me that if anybody ever messed with her, not in those words, but if anybody ever messed with her, she pulled her heel off and says, I'll get him with this. And it was a big stiletto heel. Houston police responded to Anna Trujillo's high-rise condo early Sunday morning. She called police saying she was being beaten. But when officers arrived, 59-year-old Stefan Anderson, a University of Houston biology professor, was found dead. Police say they were a couple. Anderson was stabbed in the head multiple times. According to investigators, the weapon was a stiletto heel. There's a large amount of blood that was in the residence and um, some debris that from, it looks like some type of uh, altercation that took place. The 44-year-old does have a criminal record, a DWI and also a theft by check charge. Court records indicate she also went by the name Anna Fox. Currently, she's charged with murder and her bond is set at $100,000. Then I saw the picture this morning on your website and I went, uh-oh, uh-oh, and it was Anna. Everywhere we looked, Anna, there was something common. Anna and alcohol and violence. And we literally went to, she was known to hang out in bars in downtown Houston. Um, we spoke to a bar back who is a little guy, was passing by her one day and while you know people were at the bar, he saw there was an earring on the ground. He reached down, handed it to her, and she slapped him across the face for handing her the earring. We talked to another just, person, just out of the blue, slapped him across the face. And he was a, a gentle person, really nice guy. 
Um, and, and we found these people by literally going to places we knew she went. And we asked bartenders, asked restaurant staff, hey, do you know this person? Oh yeah, we do. And it was story after story. There was a, an incident involving a, a security guard who was telling her to, to leave an establishment. And she lunged at him and he had, happened to have long hair and she pulled his hair where the hair was coming out in her, her, her hands. So there was these, these uncontrollable, unprovoked crimes of violence. Not huge, like not involving weapons, but involving her slapping people, biting people. There was a, remember how I said that she was couch surfing? Around this time, there was another former boyfriend of hers that she was staying at his residence and he had moved on and had a new girlfriend, but they were allowing her to stay at the residence. And just out of the blue, as he's sitting in the chair and the new girlfriend is witness to it, she walks up to him and bites him on his face. Were you prepared to defend her character? Oh yeah, but I couldn't uh, get people to testify for her. Why not? I'll, leave, I'll let, leave that to your imagination. started like progressively getting just out of hand, you know, starts to get angry, he gets real jealous and he started to get violent towards me and so I said, you know, I, I don't live like this, I don't want to live, you know, in a violent relationship or anything. Watching her statement to police that night, that nearly four hour long, interview. She talked about multiple men, multiple instances of abuse. I myself have been assaulted and he knew that I suffer from a post-traumatic disorder and I have, from then I I'm get nervous and I, I can't go outside from place to place. So I just, you know, and I stay with the individual, so protective uh, because uh, I suppose, uh, I'm sorry. We were never able to corroborate anything that she claimed in her statement. If we had names and there were, as I mentioned the other one, if we had other people that we knew had former relationships with them, we talked to them. Um, and there were several that we talked to. And again, the answer was always the same. Um, she was violent. Um, she, it was never a real reason for it always alcohol related, and she was not abused herself. It was a dramatic and emotional day in the courtroom. At one point, the murder defendant cried and the victim's family walked out. It was evidence the entire courtroom wanted to see, a size nine, five and a half inch stiletto covered with the victim's hair and blood. Prosecutors say the shoe is the murder weapon that Anna Trujillo used to kill her boyfriend, Stefan Anderson. On Tuesday, the jury heard the call Trujillo made to 911. As the jury listened, Trujillo began to cry. On the tape, she was nearly incoherent, telling the operator that Anderson had beat her. She then said, I hit him with my shoe. Operator, you hit him with your shoe? Yes, Trujillo responds. The operator then asks if he, Anderson, is awake now, and Trujillo says no. Later during the trial, prosecutor John Jordan climbed on top of a life-size mannequin. In front of the jury, he demonstrated how investigators believe Trujillo struck Anderson with the stiletto at least 25 times. Trujillo's attorney claims she used the shoe in self-defense after Anderson began beating her to stop her from leaving the condo. But Ashton Bowie, the first officer to respond to the scene, told jurors that when he arrived, Trujillo opened the door and was covered in blood. Officer Bowie described Anderson's body. He was covered in blood. I immediately believed that his head had been blown out. Trujillo was taken into custody that night. The jury also saw a video of the police interrogation where Trujillo insisted that she only struck Anderson with her shoe after he abused her. Why did you play the entire statement for the jury? It lends us into the mind of Anna Trujillo. When you're being asked questions, and I believe the beginning of it was, tell us what happened, and you take hours to not talk about what happened that night, but talk about all of the abuse that you have suffered your entire life, you're trying to avoid talking about that night. 
and you're trying to paint a picture of yourself. I felt very uncomfortable about it because uh, when she was told that he, you know, died, uh, there wasn't much of a reaction. And also she seemed to be more concerned about getting something to eat, you know, than about what had happened. There just wasn't any kind of remorse. She wasn't contrite at all. Did she express any kind of remorse after the fact when you were talking with her? No. I've seen in self-defense cases when a person really believes that they were justified in what they did. No remorse. That's the way I took it with her. She was completely justified and uh, that's how she felt. Why did you not put her on the stand during the guilt or innocence phase of the trial? Because she'd already been interviewed for four hours. I didn't want her being open up to the prosecutors, you know, cross-examining her in front of a jury. And a four hours is gonna come in anyway. You didn't feel she could have added more context to those four hours? I didn't think she, uh, I was afraid she'd lose control when she was testifying. She very, as we discussed earlier, very demonstrative. She was very emotional and what can I say, I didn't think she'd make a good witness. You know, that was one of the first cases of which I did a true reenactment in the courtroom and there was a method to it. Um, we got up on the table, we used a dummy. Um, I got on the table as if I was um, Anna Trujillo on top of Stefan and, and I showed how he was struck with, and we used it with Chris Duncan as the blood spatter expert because he had done the measurements and he was explaining this is exactly what you would see. The injury sustained on Stefan Anderson, um, to put it in perspective for your viewers, his face looked like Swiss cheese. She hit him so many times with that stiletto heel and we put in evidence the medical examiner had taken an x-ray of that heel where it looks like an ice pick. And there weren't fractures. He bled to death. So it was that kind of force, those kind of markings. It's hard for me to understand how she would be able to strike him 25 or 30 times and cause that much blood and not realize you killed him. And Listen to that 911 call. Yes, she appears emotional. She also appears intoxicated. One of the other pieces of testimony that came out was that he had defensive wounds, but she didn't. So if he was the aggressor and she was trying to save her own life, how is it she didn't have defensive wounds, but he did? He was a wrestler. He's a fairly, fairly large man and he was strong and he had wrestled in college or something, Switzerland or Sweden, someplace. And like I said earlier, when he started pushing her back, he shoved her over a couch, big couch, and it overturned. That still doesn't explain why he had defensive wounds, but she did not. He's a wrestler. I don't think he, uh, you know, is punching her or trying to stab her. Stefan Anderson, as a young preteen teenager, was involved in fitness in Sweden. <laughs> At the time of his death, he's in his 60s. To suggest that some type of um, 40 years before in high school that he put him in a lock. To answer your question, they actually called an MMA expert to the stand. And you can read the transcript. We made him into our witness. And we walked through the crime scene with him. And he had to concede everything that we said. Did you at any point believe she ever had to defend herself that night? I never believed for a moment that she had to defend herself at all. You know, you have to look at everything. You have to be open to all possibilities, you know? And, and so when we're talking to people in his past and talking to people in her past, it's important. What are they telling us? Well, in his past, they're saying he's gentle. In her past, she's violent and indiscriminately so. What does the crime scene tell us? The crime scene tells us she's on top of him her, her genes are blood soaked. All of the strikes are happening while he is on his back. And the person who last saw you moments before you did this says she was yelling and cursing at him and he was just being calm. Everything was pointing in one direction that there might've been domestic violence here, but it was on her being 
violent on him, not the other way around. I think you said to the jury, she's not crazy, she's scary crazy. I did. I don't know if you can still say that in 2023, but that's, that's how I, I viewed it, is, you know, you wanna, it's a certain kind of craziness that you need to avoid. And unfortunately, Stefan Anderson did not. Why would she go to that extreme? Did you ever find out? Never found out um, the true motive. You know, whether, you know, I, I can speculate that perhaps, you know, he was embarrassed by how she treated him in that cab in front of people. Maybe he said, you're gonna have to get out because remember she was spending the night and I believe was gonna go on a bus to West Texas to her children the next day. Perhaps that set her off. Um, perhaps she wanted to get back together with him and him rejecting her. We will never know because two people would know is Anna Trujillo and Stefan. And you can't believe a word that comes out of Anna Trujillo's mouth. We, the jury, find the defendant, Anna Trujillo, also known as Anna Fox, guilty of murder as charged in the indictment. Anna Trujillo showed no emotion after the verdict was announced. She now faces up to life in prison after being convicted of murder. During closing arguments, prosecutors urged the jury to return a guilty verdict, saying Trujillo made up her story that she acted in self-defense. Trujillo was convicted of stabbing her boyfriend, University of Houston professor Stefan Anderson, more than 25 times with her stiletto heel. Her attorney told the jury the prosecution did not show motive and that she was a victim of domestic violence. As long as she was justified from the first to the last strike, the jury has to find her not guilty. Carroll also questioned the credibility of witnesses and the actions of emergency responders. But in the rebuttal, prosecutor Jack Jordan reminded jurors that Trujillo hit Anderson 25 times. Trujillo, he said, is guilty of murder. One of the things that the foreman had said after the verdict was that was just too many blows to the head. 25 blows to the head was just too many to be self-defense. Another, you know, maybe she went overboard. I don't know, maybe he was getting a hold of her and she had to do what she did. The punishment phase, you still had a glimmer of hope there. You said this was a woman who needs mercy. Yeah, it was obvious that you know, if she hadn't planned on killing him, it's obvious that it was sudden passion. But you put her on the stand during the punishment phase. Punishment, yeah. It's just Why the change? Well, she'd been sitting there during the whole trial, and she knew what, maybe what the jury believed. They convicted her pretty quick. And uh, I was hoping, you know, we could get that sudden passion. You argued, no, this is not sudden passion. Why? You know, it, if a jury comes back and believes that there was sudden passion, one, it has to be from an adequate cause that would cause an ordinary person um, to react in such a way. And that would significantly change the punishment range. The maximum she could get would be 20 years. We argued against it because one, there was no adequate cause. There was no evidence whatsoever of Stefan Anderson doing anything that would warrant her behavior. So don't even get at the first one. And then secondly, would anybody, a rational person in her shoes do that? I mean, you can't really have it both ways. You can't claim self-defense and a jury rejects that and say, okay, it wasn't self-defense, but I just, I just did it out of passion. And, and what a lot of folks think is because you're passionate, you get sudden passion. Law well, doesn't work that way. Um, the example of a sudden passion is your child is molested and, um, and you find out right away and you just can't control your emotions to protect your child so you react. Or a spouse comes home and they catch their significant other in bed with somebody else and they, they react that way. So it has to be something like that. Attorneys for Anna Trujillo asked for mercy, but in the end, Trujillo received the harshest possible punishment. Assess her punishment at confinement in the Institutional Division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for life. Trujillo and her family members in the courtroom sobbed after the life sentence was announced. She will now spend the rest of her life behind bars for stabbing University of Houston professor Dr. Stefan Anderson with her five and a half inch heel stiletto shoe. My uncle was a great man. He was kind and he did everything for everyone all the time. 
Earlier in closing arguments, prosecutors said Trujillo would be a continuing threat if she was allowed to walk away a free woman. Anna Trujillo violently beat her intimate partner to death for no reason. That is what makes her so dangerous. But Trujillo's defense attorneys argued she deserved leniency because she acted with sudden passion. Show mercy to Ms. Trujillo, who needs mercy so much right now. Before being sent to prison, Anderson's family members were able to give a victim impact statement to describe how difficult and painful their lives have been since their loved one was murdered at the hands of Anna Trujillo. He didn't deserve what happened to him, and even if nothing can get him back again, we're, we're, we're happy that justice is served. You know, biggest case I ever had, and lost it quicker than I've ever lost anything before. Is it true, did you really give the bailiff five to one odds that they were gonna come back with a not guilty? And I was joking, and I think John Jordan was walking by. I got a little bit cocky about it, and so I had to eat that, you know, five to one. But I, you know, if he'd taken the bet up, I probably would have uh, done it five to one odds. I seemed pretty uh, silly, you know, on retrospect, but that was pretty, uh, pretty tough trial and tensions were running a little bit high. When you think back now, do you still believe everything she told you? I do. Some, some people, they just, I don't know what it is with them, but they don't have the, they don't, they're not liars. I don't know if they don't have the imagination or they know that you can tell if they're lying so they don't lie or whatever. I think she told me the truth on, on everything. You know, we asked the jury um, during jury selection is when a man kills a woman, nobody questions it. They're like, okay, did he do it? And they were like, but if a woman kills a man, the first question is, what did he do? And so we, we had to kind of flip that. We had to, because we're, we're dealing with stereotypes a lot of times in this courthouse, and you have to let that go and just let the evidence take you where it is. Really, to me, it was a gentleman who was kind, and he was just in the wrong relationship. Uh, so all these years later, what I try and convey is this is not about Anna Trujillo. This is about Stefan Anderson. Um, and what I said in closing, I think is true for, for a lot of the, they, she was known, you know, as Anna Trujillo or Anna Fox, or depending on who it was. But once the jury convicted her, she became a murderer, um, a convicted murderer. You know, there is a message out there um, for the community to understand. I mean, we have done a great job of, of empowering women to tell them, please, you know, we can have shelters for you. Although when you leave, that is a homicidal time, but we've done a good job of that. Maybe we haven't done as good a job of when men are in abusive relationships or when females are, are verbally abusive and then it, it, it escalates. Anna Trujillo is now 54 years old and she's serving a life sentence at the Mountain View Prison Unit in Gatesville, Texas. However, she will be eligible for parole in the year 2043. She declined our request for an interview. We're back next week with a case involving Josue Flores. He was an 11-year-old boy who was stabbed to death while walking home from school. Being 11 years old and walking home from school, block and a half from your home, you should be safe. And I think it just touched a nerve in our community from the get-go. A new episode of The Evidence Room streams every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. on KPRC 2 Plus. For everyone at the KPRC 2 Investigates team, I'm Robert Arnold. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.